Welcome back to theheart.org. Um, my name is Professor Tony Gushik from the University Hospitals of Leicester, UK, and it's, uh, I'm here in Munich, uh, ESC 2012, and it's my privilege to enter into conversations with the various PIs who have presented at the late breaking and keynote sessions, and it's also my absolute privilege uh, to have as a guest today uh, Dr. Bernard Brun, uh, the person who perhaps is most responsible for uh, the use of the uh, fractional flow reserve uh, as a way of investigating patients with uncertain or intermediate uh, lesions. Now, um, we're going to discuss uh, FAME 2. Um, it would be useful to give some of the audience who may not be certain some of the background, FAME 1, and perhaps those results and why we moved on to FAME 2. And then we'll talk about the study uh, its design and then we'll move th rapidly through to its uh, results but what I'd be most interested in is the implications of the study for all those people out there who are listening to us so welcome and uh, Bernard just give us a little bit of uh, background of, uh, to FAME 2 yeah thank you Tony well the background of the FAME 2 study can be summarized as following first PCI has never been shown to improve prognosis when performed in patients with stable coronary artery disease. Second, in FAME 1 we have demonstrated then that fractional flow reserve guided PCI is better for the patient than angiographically guided PCI. Nevertheless, most trials previously performed in patients with stable coronary artery disease have based their recruitment mainly on the angiographic characteristics of the patients plus very often clinical data, but the main factor was the angiographic guidance. And therefore, it is very likely that in many of these patients there was no or very little ischemia, and that's the background of the study of the FAME 2 study. Excellent. So, very important study because what we're saying is that sometimes we see a lesion yeah. and we think it needs treating, and we may treat them inappropriately or unnecessarily. This is very pertinent at the moment. And vice versa. versa. And vice versa. So, um, tell us about the number of patients, the entry criteria, and the, the trial design. Yeah, well, by definition, we selected patients with stable coronary artery disease who were selected for a one, two, or three vessel PCI with drug eluting stent. But the first step of the study, and this is really in contrast to all previous trials, is that all the lesions uh, considered as targets for stents were first measured with FFR. So the fractional flow reserve was assessed in all the lesions, and only if at least one stenosis in a major epicardial vessel was hemodynamically significant, in other words, mm. if the patient could be considered as ischemic, these patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either PCI with regulating stents or medical therapy alone. Did they have pre- angiography, non-invasive testing? Well, many of them had, but this was not a prerequisite to be selected for so the So that was ignored, study. Yes, and they were randomized according to any lesion, or were there angiographic criteria? D there were actually no exclusion criteria on the basis of the angiogram, except the suspicion, angiographically, of a left main stenosis. Right. And I would like to come back to the design, if you allow me, because I just described a randomized trial, but if the patient happened to have none of these angiographically visible stenosis, which was hemodynamically significant, these patients were not excluded from the study. They were just treated medically mm. and followed up in a registry. And this registry happened to be 27% of the entire study population. Which is interesting in itself. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Just a uh, courage trial fits in here somewhere because we're about to talk about optimal medical therapy. So just give the audience 30 seconds less on the courage trial and how this fits in because courage said that optimal medical therapy... Well, you tell us. Well, it's obvious that we have built our FAME 2 trial on the experience accumulated and all what we learned from the COURAGE trial. Yeah. But the main difference with the COURAGE trial is that in the randomized cohort of the FAME2 trial, all the patients, 100% of the patients, had at least one, sometimes two or three ischemic lesions in the coronary artery. While in COURAGE, when we go back to the 
myocardial perfusion sub-study of courage, it's clear that only approximately less than one third actually Absolutely. of the patients had extensive ischemia. And this is the main difference. Actually, the selection is the main difference. Of course, there are many other differences which are related to the difference in era where these studies were conducted. So, but the similarity, of course, is that the patients who came to got optimal medical therapy. Yeah. So this was an ischemia-driven intervention with optimal medical therapy versus optimal medical therapy in patients who had a hemodynamically a flow-limiting lesion. Exactly. And what was your cutoff? Just remind us, remind the audience. Uh, 0.80. 0.8. So uh, that's perfect because now we these are these are patients that, based on previous data, suggest w would benefit from intervention. And what we're doing is comparing those patients with patients who are treated as well as they were encouraged in terms of optimal medical therapy. So that's a perfect trial. So tell us uh, what uh, you found. Well. We have to consider both the randomized trials, the ischemic patients, but also the registry patients. Yeah. They are extremely important. And let's start with the registry patients. The end point of the trial was a composite of all-cause death, myocardial infarction, and urgent revascularization, to keep it short. Now, the non-ischemic patients, the registry patients, did very well under medical therapy. Not really surprising, that's a confirmation of many other trials, including Courage, by the way. They did very, very well. In contrast, when we look at the randomized patients... Just tell us how well they did. Tell us what the endpoint of the registry patients were. Of the, the ischemic patients? Of the registry patients. Well, the registry patients had an estimated primary endpoint event rate of 3% after 12 months. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Almost so unbeatable. So that, that's also important. That's when you extremely don't have to treat important. the lesions, you can treat them up for medical therapy. That's the first. You put that to one side. That's the first message. Okay. So that's the first message. The most important results are derived, of course, from the randomized course of patients. When you take patients with ischemia, one, two, or three vessel ischemic lesions, and you randomize them to medical treatment, they will have an eightfold increase in terms of primary endpoint as compared to the registry patients, but also the same difference as compared to the same ischemic patients randomized to receive a stent. Yeah. Which means that actually in these ischemic patients, by putting a stent, by alleviating the ischemia, by removing the abnormal resistance at the epicardial level, we bring them back to their baseline level, which of is that the, of the registry patients. Of the medically treated non-flow limiting lesions. So that's that's very, very interesting. Um, and just remind us for those who have forgotten the absolute figures, the uh, endpoint, the MACE endpoint for the three groups. So let's start with the registry patients. So the registry patient, roughly 3%, uh, the patients treated medically, so the, 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 the randomized patients uh, randomized towards uh, medical therapy alone, 12.4%, well, and the patients who received a stent, ischemic patients who received a stent, 4.2%. Uh, so that's that's a very impressive difference, and uh, I think most people listening will know that the trial was stopped early uh, by the DSMB. Yeah, that's entirely correct. Um, the DSMB uh, stopped the trial. It was a decision which was very, very hard to, to take and they thought it over very, very well, I think. But finally, the, the trial was stopped, or at least the recruitment was halted in January 2012, after 1,220 patients were included, because they saw a very significant, highly significant difference in urgent revascularization. I think it is also fair for me dur during this uh, conversation to add that the primary endpoint was mainly driven by this third component of the, of, uh, let's say, which is the urgent revascularization. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a lot of criticism out there when DSMBs halt trials, of course, you know, and I've heard the criticism, but I think if they see a significant difference, it's almost unethical to continue to recruit patients to an arm that may not be beneficial to them. So I'm one who actually believe that in the right circumstances, it is appropriate yeah. for the DSMB to halt the trial. It carries a big, uh, a big uh, weight with it when mm -hmm. such a thing happens. So here am I in my cath lab. I see patients with two or three vessel disease. 
Uh, do I do FFR on all of them, cost efficacy and all that? Do I select those that are to my eye are very tight and do those routinely? Do I still depend on mm-hmm. non-invasive testing before? Where am I going to use your 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 yeah. data? Well, I think that we have to go to, to go back to clinical practice indeed, and let's figure out we are dealing with stable patients. We, for a moment, forget about all the unstable patients, of the fifty percent of, of our population, by the way, stable patients. Now, many of them, but actually in daily practice, it is approximately fifty of them will. 50% of them will come with indeed a non-invasive workup which will be relatively satisfactory at least for one vessel disease patients. Mm. But in the other half, very often non-invasive test is, testing is simply not available at the time of catheterization. Mm. Good or not, that's another question, but that's clinical practice and this has been uh, validated in the large registry, especially in the United States. So we are with a patient with optimal non-invasive testing. If there is a one vessel disease, there is a perfect fit and match between non-invasive data and what we see on the angiogram and that the clinic is uh, obvious. We just go for PCI, we don't bother sure, sure. measuring the fresh. But we have to admit this is the minority of the patients. Yeah. So for mo- most patients where you either don't have non-invasive testing or where you're uncertain about the interpretation of the non-invasive test and you see a lesion that you think could re- be responsible, then you're recommending that they will do better with FFR determining whether or not they should be stented and that if the FFR comes out at 0.8 or less, then they should be stenting and they will do better than non-stenting in such patients. Is that is that the take-home message? That's actually a fair summary of the take-home message. I would even go one step further. I think that there is a kind of consensus now in the cardiological community to state that to treat the patients optimally, stable patients, we need both anatomy and function. Well, the best way of obtaining anatomy is still the coronary angiogram. Resolution is 10 times higher than the CT. The best way to obtain functional information is FFR. This can both be obtained, you know it very well, 5-10 minutes during the coronary angiogram, in the cat lab, same day, same place, same time, by the same operator, that's also important. So that we might even suggest that in patients with let's say intermediate risk and certainly the patient at high risk we could propose to go straight to the cat lab straight to the cat lab to obtain an angiogram provided of course you have the ability of obtaining the functional information at the same time well you know for me FFR helps enormously because it takes away those difficult decisions and gives you confidence both treating and non-treating patients and I think you have to be congratulated on a second outstanding study you and your colleagues of course and all the contributors to the study and I'm very grateful for you taking the time out of a busy schedule to come and chat today so thank you very much indeed. It's my pleasure. So I hope you've enjoyed the program and uh, uh, thank you very much indeed for watching. Excellent. That was fantastic, sir. Brilliant. Mind your head. Yep. Okay. It's a sauna here.